Hey there, fellow parents. Welcome to the Real Life of Parenting podcast, where we're all about embracing the chaos, sharing the laughter, and navigating the roller coaster ride of parenthood. I'm Jeff. And I'm Jenna. And, and together, together, we're, we're your, your co pilots on, on this adventure. adventure. Each episode, we'll dive into the highs and the lows and the hilariously unpredictable moments that make parenting the wild journey it is. So get ready for real stories, genuine conversations, and a few parenting hacks along the way. Whether you're dealing with diaper disasters or celebrating those small victories, we've got your back. So buckle up, hit play, and let's embark on this parenting odyssey together. This is The Real Life of Parenting, where every episode is a reminder that you are not alone in the beautiful chaos of raising little ones. Hello and welcome back to The Real Life Parenting Podcast. Today we have our special guest, Valerie Pobsfield. She's an author, writer, podcaster. She kind of does it all the mom that does everything um you can find out a little bit more about her on her website to mom to love.com anyways val how are you i'm doing well thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it yeah not a problem we appreciate having you yeah so, so I, guess, I guess um, um uh i guess, I guess we'll start, start with, with um that. just tell us tell about us yourself. yourself um and uh yeah, yeah. Let's, let's let's just start, start with, start that. with that. that tell, tell us about, about yourself <laughs> yeah well thank you so much and i absolutely am loving your podcast episodes and i um i'm excited just to talk with you guys about really i guess this is who i am now is motherhood and or being a mom and so i mean i can say a lot about myself i guess but like my big thing that i have learned over the past 10 years now is that I am not an A plus mom. I'm not a perfect mom. <laughs> so I um, studied for motherhood though. Like I, it was an examination. And so I, you know, I'm a nurse practitioner. I worked in pediatrics and I, I come from a, a childhood that my parents are doing the best they could, but I wanted to do some, something a bit different. But when I studied for all of this for motherhood, before I became a mom, I was like, I'm going to do this all right. I'm going to be perfect. And I guess um, perfection was kind of my thing. But then once I uh, became a mom, my first was taken to the NICU within 10 minutes. And this illusion of control was taken away. And that's when I really started writing and doing all of the stuff that you had mentioned, uh, because it just... I really felt like there was a lot I learned from having that control taken away. And I have been essentially, I think, kind of like working my, on myself every day since then. And some days are better than others. Some hours are better than others. But I try to you know, inspire other moms as well. And I don't even know if inspire is the right word, but I just want other moms to come and be in this community to embrace imperfection with me. So sorry, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> no that was a perfect answer (laughs) that was perfect and uh, where are you located located now I am in the Chicago area so I have been here for four years now I guess almost five years and uh, I was in Texas for a while before that but I'm originally from the Chicagoland area and my husband's originally a Texan so um so yeah (laughs) we have two different parts of of the United States and uh, it was uh, Texas has a lot of personality. So <laughs> two of my kids were born in Texas and one was born in, um, in Illinois. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Been a little bit of everywhere. Eh? Yep. And fun fact, if you want to have Texas soil underneath your labor bed, you can request that. So your child can be born on Texas soil. So I did not do that was my third who was born in Illinois, but much to my husband's concern about that. But (laughs) I can say that we didn't do that either. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's neat. Yeah. And how old are your kids now? So uh, eight years old, five and three. So they keep me busy. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. We're still dealing with two toddlers, so it's quite uh, quite busy for us, I would say. But, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's always a workout every it's day. It's little guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 100%. One thing I kind of wanted to touch back on was your uh, your story about just being a mom and you know, having an inclusive environment as motherhood. And 
we strive for something very similar, but just like as parents in general, right? That's kind of the whole purpose of starting this is to have that community where you can feel accepted for not being perfect. So like just perfectly imperfect, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that's so important. Like, I think that we are as parents entirely too hard on ourselves. And I mean, really at the end of the day, I don't want to be a perfect mom because Life mm-hmm. is not perfect. And I want to, you know, talk with my kids about things that I'm working on. Like everyone's working on something. And I really love embracing the growth mindset as a parent, as opposed to this, like, I either passed or I failed because we're always learning. Mm-hmm. And when I mess up, when I, if I yell too much or whatever, I apologize. And we, you know, we, we always work on something and that's okay. And giving myself that grace is sometimes easier said than done. Cause I think we are so hard on ourselves, but when yeah. I do that, um, I feel like, you know, I'm teaching my children how to love themselves as well. If we're, we're doing those things together. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, like we're our, kids i mean we're the models of of how to how to behave on an everyday basis and just everything they learn from us sometimes they do get the better of you and you're like i don't mean to be this mean to you but we really are pushing all the buttons today yes yeah i know i've learned to tell them when i get tired like okay mom's getting tired so remember mom starts yelling more when she's tired so let's go to bed (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's a very good thing to teach them is understanding like their their emotions in general and you know I guess that that's the whole the whole purpose is to maybe be a good educator for that understanding how their emotions are and how they should maybe act towards how they're feeling essentially or how they shouldn't act yes. based off of an impulse. Mm-hmm. Yes, I yeah, agree absolutely. Like with ours, when Liam for the hundredth time today is just standing at the very top of the slide and you're like, you need to sit your butt down and he's just laughing at you and you're, you can't, you can't help, but like be like, sit down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or they just do something just to spite the other one, just to, oh, yeah. you know, like just to mm-hmm. tickle that nerve that just sets them off. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know it is. It's always something, always something like we were running late just now to mm-hmm. piano lessons and, one of them was ref- refusing to put her buck or she went, didn't want me to buckle her into her car seat. She only wanted her to buckle yeah. herself in, but then we're running late and it's like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I just need you to get buckled in. <laughs> it's like it's just this like ridiculous like, conversation about why we have to buckle each other, you know, and it's, it turns into yeah. like just a yelling match. And we're like, but like, well, I'll try again next time, you know, but at the same time, like, I don't know. Like we're all, again, we're all learning together and kids are learning, we're learning and it's okay. Like it's okay. And as long as Mm -hmm. I am, um, I feel like, you know, when, when I learned that I did not have control very early on, I looked up in my journaling kind of what mother means. And I just like the etymology of words. I think it's really interesting uh, to look that up and Mother is actually a noun and a verb. And I thought it was interesting that there's like to mother or to mom. And it essentially means to give birth or allow one to rise or to care for or protect. And when you think about like what does all those things, that's love. And so really that's the only thing I can control. And I was kind of just writing about that of like in the moment right now, I could either act in love or I can act in fear, which I think a lot of times like frustration, all that kind of stems down to fear of something. Um, so what can I do in this moment? Um, and then just going to the next moment and the next moment, because we really just have the present moment. That's all that we have. Otherwise, um, you know, we're in our head if we're traveling to the future with anxiety or to the past with rumination, like our kids aren't really joining us in those moments. They're here and then now. Yeah. Um, um, what did you do? Um, like before you started podcasting, before you started writing, even before you did like, um, like the website and your branding and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And I, when you asked me what I did, I went on a tangent about all my, all the stuff I'm doing now, but I didn't, I didn't say what exactly like 
I have done beforehand. So um, I'm a nurse practitioner and I actually, so in college, um, I first started um, music performance as my major. I'm a flutist. Um, I don't play as much anymore, but I do try to sometimes. Um, but that was essentially like what I trained to do. Um, so I did music performance. I um, then decided one day that it wasn't one day, but I feel like over time, I just felt like a, a really like a calling to be a nurse. Um, just I loved healthcare and I loved learning about the body and educating people about their health and learning about it myself. Um, so I decided to do that. And I worked in um, pediatrics for a little bit, went to grad school um, for my family nurse practitioner certification at Yale. And then I worked in PD Neuro, um, as well as like um, preventative health, family practice, a couple other things. Um, so that's kind of like what my professional background is. But I think as myself, which everyone has like their own self, like we, we are a mom, we're a dad, but Valerie, who Valerie is, is like, I like to travel. I like to... Um, have adventure and I like to learn. And I literally just listed that off of a value list that a couple of years ago, I, I didn't know what my values were. So now I have these things of what does Valerie like? So, um, so that's a little bit about myself. So one thing that we've noticed that you are, uh, you're, you're currently a writer, um, yeah. what kind of stuff are you writing about or what are you currently working on? Yeah. So thank you for asking. So I am essentially writing about my journey of becoming a mom. And I think a lot of this started when I was in my 20s. I wrote a summary of what did I learn in my 20s? And I thought it was a really interesting thing to write about. Of like, what have I learned in this past decade? So two years ago, I was turning 38 and I realized that I'm going to be turning 40 soon. So I'm going to have to write another summary of the decade and what I learned. And I was thinking, you know, I just learned a lot as a, as a parent. <laughs> and so maybe <laughs> I should just write a book about it. And so um, that's really where it, the idea came from. And so then I just started writing and I found it there, very therapeutic. And a lot of what I wrote about was when we were in the NICU and what I learned I don't even know if learn is the right word, but um, kind of just the experience I had. I just wrote everything mm -hmm. down because sometimes it was hard to think about. And, and to be honest, it's like I have a very, I, I have a script of what I say as far as like how it was, but like to be really vulnerable with our experience was, it was challenging. And I think that I have been very empowered, you know, with my background of being a nurse, a nurse practitioner, I've seen healthcare from both sides and I really want to help other people understand that there are resources out there and, um, and I want them to know that they're not alone. Cause I think mm -hmm. despite, you know, knowing all the, the services that there were or there were not or whatever that was, it just, I don't know, it was just so overwhelming in the moment. And I wanted just a friend. I wanted someone to talk to or to give me a hug during those times. And um, so that's what I want. I think ultimately my book and my platform to be is I want to be a friend to other moms because um, we're not alone. and we need each other. And that's so important uh, for us to, to realize that. So I think we're all kind of struggling with something. Um, and motherhood's hard. Parenting is hard, but we don't have to do that alone. Yeah. And with that being said, like with your brand um, to mom is to love, um, mm -hmm. how did you come up with like that brand specifically? Like what inspired to mom is to love. Um, so it really was that whole mom being a verb. So to mom, uh, mom being a verb. Of, so to mommy, essentially to care for and protect and to give birth and to rise, all of that is to love. And so instead of being mom, so let's say 
and, I, and this happens so many times, and I think I'm not the only one with this, but when I was in the hospital, um, so many people called me mom as opposed to my name. And it was like an immediate transition where yeah. I wasn't Valerie anymore. I was mom. And it's a beautiful name. I love the name mom, but there's also still Valerie there. And it's almost like I filled out this birth certificate of myself as well. Uh, but I, now my new name's mom. And so I have all these expectations mm -hmm. of being a mom. I, society has all these expectations of mom. Um, so I want to control mom. I want to control the noun mom. I want to control the title mom. But when I think of mom as a verb, when I mom in my life, when I to mom in my life, I then focus on love. I don't focus on like all these expectations and like sometimes the shame or wh or whatever that is. I'm focusing on love then. And I think that that paradigm shift is what makes all the difference, at least for me. Because that's all we can control. So, um, so that's kind of where I came up with that. And um, I talked with one of my author friends, and he's like, "Yeah, I like the, I like the sound of that." And so I'm like, "Okay, well, I'll roll with it." <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I I think I can I can definitely relate to that. Um, being in the NICU with our first, um, it, was it was pretty, pretty shortly, shortly after yeah. he was in the NICU. Like I was always like, call either mom or mama or yeah or whatever they wanted to call you. And it's like, my name is Jenna, <laughs> yeah. but I was okay with it. it. Like but I was fine you're with just it. Just thrown into the wrong. Yeah. It's quite a change, right? It's very overwhelming. <laughs> Definitely culture shock. If you're not prepared, essentially, like we were early, so we weren't prepared. <laughs> yes. Um, I can definitely relate to the, you know, not, not feeling like, like feeling alone, I guess, while you're in that setting. Um, and that feeling of there's n no one really sharing with you or you're not able to open up to anyone because there's not really anyone there, mm -hmm. I think is a big thing with the, uh, with the NICU. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is definitely relatable. Um, even though they're like, oh, there's all these services, you can talk to someone if you need to. And it's like, but like, they're not experiencing it with you. Um, even when we were in there together, I don't think we discussed it. So we, even though we were experiencing this together, it wasn't like a, like a together experience because it was just like more of a survival experience, more of a make yeah. sure he's okay. Kind like of a thing. fight or flight. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Cause it mm -hmm. is, it is like a fight or flight situation. And yeah. I completely relate to all of that. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I mean, as you guys can see, as I, talking or as your listeners are hearing, like, I have this um, very much a kind of um, memorized script that I say, which I, I love everything I say, and it's from my writing and all. But at the same time, it's hard to take down the wall of the like, it's hard for me, like when I, I can't, I, I don't know how to go there and talk about what it is. Like I learned a lot, but like to take mm -hmm. myself mentally back there, like I don't want to mentally go back there, but I do at the same time, you know, cause it, I know that's helpful for healing and for growth. And I think what you guys do is so important because mm -hmm. when you are talking, then I think for listeners to hear that, Oh wait, there was someone else who was in this like really hard time. Like, it's, it, it means so much, you know? Um, I mean, it's different. Like I, I think for me right now it's different. Cause like, I want to make sure I'm talking too about, you know, what I do, but at the same time, I think that there is such power in just knowing that we all were in this together, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. For sure. that, makes, that makes perfect sense. We're <laughs> yeah. obviously not going to pester you about any of your past or anything like that oh gosh um, no i want no, well, <laughs> well that was saying like i think that's helpful but, too you know and like yep. but yeah i think that um yeah no i'm glad that we're oh. i'm glad that we're doing it you know because yeah, people exactly. need to hear it i appreciate the words from you um and it, and like just letting us know that we're we're kind of heard like i think yeah. that's a big thing um, yeah. And we didn't really even face the NICU stuff till we decided we would do a podcast and we literally sat down and we just started 
going over at everything and we're like, oh, this happened and then this happened and this happened. Oh, and this happened. Oh, and I forgot about this. This is like, even now, like the story that we have isn't 100% the story. It's more like condensed. It's very (laughs) condensed. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's not the entirety, but it's, it's kind of like our, our main story, the main point we wanted to get across. And yeah, we really wanted to make people feel like there is someone else that has experienced what they're experiencing or if they can relate or maybe help them kind of find some sort of therapeutic response to how mm-hmm. they're feeling. Yeah. Yes. And just be like relatable and comfortable with sharing yeah. stuff um, that they may not be, you know, completely comfortable sharing with either their family or their friends or anything like that. Just on a relatable level with a stranger is I think yeah. such a big, big part. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, Yeah, I guess guess with that that said, I mean, let's, um, I guess guess let's let's learn about a little bit about your, your your NICU journey there, Valerie. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, So I think that, you know, a lot of it, um, gosh, so I don't know where to start with it, but there was so much unknown at first. And I think that when I was pregnant, so that this was my first pregnancy and I very much, um, you know, obviously like with everyone with their first pregnancy, it's this new experience. It's so novel. And I remember traveling, um, in my second trimester, And just being so concerned about everything. And I don't know about in Canada, but I know like in the United States, they have all these rules that you have to do. Like you can't have, what is that? Like salami or um, certain types of cheese and like all this stuff, you know, and um, which I understand like what the rule and all that. But I, I think I let my, I have a tendency to have, um, like anxiety and sometimes it would get into OCD. And I think I really became OCD about those things where I was just constantly not wanting to eat things that were not, you know, completely a hundred percent pregnancy approved. And so, you know, and then when we're in pregnancy, there's so much, um, I don't know, we don't want to eat everything. Like, you know, you have all of these preferences. <laughs> and so, mm-hmm. It was just, I, I remember that being really stressful at first, just that part of it, like always being in my head, I guess, like this OCD, this ruminating about what am I going to do that's going to hurt the baby? Like the self shame where it's like, I'm trying my best to not hurt the baby, but I have this shame of like, what if I eat this is going to hurt the baby? And oh my gosh, I ate like, what, what if this cheese was not on the approved list? You know, like it was just, it, that's when it started. Um kind of like these anxious thoughts. And I remember going on this trip in my second trimester and um, being on the beach and just overwhelmed because I had a smoothie in my hand. And I was like, oh my gosh, I remember that. You know, one of the not approved items. And (laughs) I didn't live in the moment though. Like I did not, I was walking on a beach in Hawaii looking at Diamond Head like I think that's called Diamond Head, the mountain there on that Waikiki beach. And um, I was with a few girlfriends and I missed it. Like I saw it, but I, but I missed it though. And cause I was in my head about the smoothie. And like, I clearly remember the smoothie more than I remember the view and being in the ocean, you know, being on the beach and all this. <laughs> and, and then if I wasn't doing that, I was studying about motherhood. I mean, like maybe I'm a little, I, I can get a little obsessive about the stuff like this, a mm-hmm. plus mother. Like I truly did like study on the beach, like parenting books, like underlying things, not enjoying the moment. So anyway, that's kind of like what my pregnancy was for a little bit. And then, um, there were just some, um, things that we wanted to monitor and it really completely got me very concerned and nervous, um, that maybe the trip, like it was always the self-blame, always this OCD, um, that was just like, what happened? What did I do wrong? Which I didn't do anything wrong. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think my mind wanted to blame myself for it. And so, um, I remember having a conversation with my OB about, and him, he was wonderful. Like he said, nothing is going to happen to your baby 
um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of your baby. I'm not going to let anything happen to your baby. Um, so we were induced and <laughs> that morning the nurse told me that he broke his ankle and that he wasn't coming in. <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> like, like straight out of a movie. <laughs> you know? and I'm like, but he, this was the one that told me everything was going to be okay. And, um, you know, like he really calmed my fears that I don't think other providers were able to do. Um, and I mm-hmm. think a lot of it was because I was in the medical field. I knew a lot of these worst case scenarios, um, which I think being in the medical field is both a blessing and a curse. Um, so I knew how to advocate, advocate, but I also, um, I, I could really ruminate on things. The delivery itself wasn't bad, but they, she um, needed to go to the NICU. And I remember um, them saying if I wanted to hold her right away and being, a, I don't know, I think like with your mom intuition, like you're hearing all these things, like something's happening to your baby. So you should, I didn't want to hold her because I'm like, well, if, if there's something wrong, like take her. Like, I don't want, like, I don't want to be taking time away from you guys giving medical intervention mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, so I held her for a second, but just not, but you know, like I didn't, I wanted to let her be, um, have her be okay. Um, so I do have one picture of, but, um, of that moment, but it's of me and like, she's covered up a little bit. So I remember like telling my husband, if, if there was going to be a NICU that, um, have him go with her. So she wasn't alone. Um, and I stayed there and I remember, I don't know, just, I, I think just with all the drugs they gave me, I kind of was in and out and he sent me this picture of her with her eyes wide open. And it was like the hardest thing to see because it was so beautiful. Like she was so beautiful, but I wasn't there. Like, sorry, like that makes me emotional. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, No, that's okay. Yeah. It was just like, like the first time your baby looks at you. um, And I'm glad she was looking at dad, um, but she wasn't looking at me and it made me so sad um, but also at the same time, so happy that I'm a mom. And it was like this mixture of emotions. And um, in retrospect now, I absolutely love that I have that photo because I have captured the first time I became a mom. And it's a beautiful photo. It's like my favorite photo. Um, so, but at the time it was very difficult. Um, uh, the way the hospital was set up, I it was not an easy a commute. <laughs> I felt like it was a commute from the OB area to the NICU. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like seven floors apart and it took like oh, 20 geez. minutes to get to. And I remember like it was 24 hours before I was able to go into the NICU because of all of this ridiculous, like checking to make sure I was okay, which yes, it's, I mean, I don't mean to say it's ridiculous, but at the time I felt like it was ridiculous. I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. Like, I just want to see my baby. <laughs> and I remember my husband said he had reflux and it was bad. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I don't care about your reflux. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, the baby's stable. I've got reflux though, just so you know. <laughs> I've got to sit down for a second. I got some reflux. So, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> so I think I got a little loud where I'm like, I just want to go. And like the nurse came in and, um, She's like, okay, well, let me try and get you out of here. Kind of like trying to be like, okay, I'm going to take care of this before this mom starts like yelling and the whole floor could hear her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Kind of felt like I was being forced, you know, I don't know what the right word would be, but just not able to go. Um, so then so some of this, like I haven't really even written about or talked about. So sorry if it's like. Kind That's of, okay. <laughs> don't don't worry yeah. about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. We went, so I finally got wheeled up to the NICU and I just remember seeing her for the first time and, um, she looked exactly like my baby picture of me Uh as a baby. And I remember like that being the first thing I thought, like, I know she's mine. Like that looks like me. She Mm -hmm. looks like me. And it was just, gosh, I mean, like as parents, we all have that, that first image of when we really do see our baby is and just such a beautiful memory that we won't ever forget. And, um, that was that memory when I finally actually saw her. And, um, then I saw she had an IV in her and then my nursing 
kicked in and I saw like she was on the monitors and like the monitors she was moving and the monitors were beeping. So I'm like silencing the alarms, pretending almost like I'm a provider and like picking her up and like, I don't know who was with me. Maybe it was, this was like before COVID and all, and it's been a few years, but I think someone in the family was with us. And I remember they were a little nervous. They're like, Oh, you can't like pull up like the cords. And I'm like, I can do it. I know what I'm doing. Like, just let me hold my baby. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> like I'm silencing all of this. And so, <laughs> but anyway, I just remember, well, I guess this is timely, this part of it. Cause I, um, then started playing the music that I played for her. Um, cause you know, being a musician, I knew so much about music and how the ears would develop, you know, or I'm sorry, hearing mm-hmm. develops at whatever time. And I remember like to the day that I was told what week it was that babies in utero or in your belly can hear. It's like, I'm going to start playing the flute. I'm going to start playing the piano for her and playing all these pieces. So that's what I immediately did. I was like singing songs to her, playing for her, like what we had played. And you could tell she recognized it, um, which was such a beautiful moment. And it was, I think, for hours, like, which I'm so glad I had. Um, and, um, you know, the nurses were coming in and all of that. And I just remember her board, her IV board. But I was able to, like, enjoy her. Um, and then I thought it was very timely because, um, actually, the other day, she had piano lessons. And I was thinking about how now I'm the listener because um, she plays the piano so beautifully. And now I'm listening to her. And um, I thought that was like really nice of, um, you know, these times in our lives in the NICU or they were difficult and they made such an impact on us as parents. Um, But there's more to the story and there's more to our journey. And I was able to see that the other day where I'm like, gosh, I, I, here she is playing the piano and just this like, um, you know, beautiful child that's growing up. And I'm so like, blessed to be her mom and um anyway um but so um yeah there were just a lot of tests that were done uh because um I mean for her privacy I don't really want to go into like all of the medical specifics but um it was always just doctors going in and out and me questioning things and um they would test because they wanted to test a lot of the times. And I think being a healthcare provider, I would challenge that. And they did not, some of them did not like when I challenged it. And I was in full bear mama mode. And I (laughs) told them what I thought about that. (laughs) And um, um, some of them, I think it damaged their ego a little bit. Um, You know, their doctors were great. Yeah, that's that's (laughs) the thing. Like, I yeah, I can can definitely definitely relate to that, that, Valerie. Um, honestly, honestly, like, like, obviously, I wasn't in the health profession. Yeah, but um, with our little guy, I mean, they they were were testing him almost every day, doing blood work almost every day. Um, and like I had said before, like he was was so so anemic. anemic, Um, at one point because because they they don't grow the blood blood cells that that we do or at the pace we do so like like, whenever they were doing the vials of blood they were just literally sucking the life out of him um and like like, i remember him literally like i think it was like a day or two after of like a big a big big blood blood work work day day. he was just pale and like usually like he would wake up with like a diaper change or whatever and like he was just so pale and literally just laying there lifeless and I was just like oh my god at one point I just said okay this has to stop like we need to just do the tests that need to be done not the ones that you want to get done we're going to be here for a while anyway yes so we're going to get to those tests regardless but like can we just keep it to the ones that are necessary right now because he's not doing well (laughs) yes Absolutely. And we have yeah. that mom intuition. And I'm so glad, you know, and, and so proud that you did those things because I, I think, you know, as healthcare providers, we are trying our best, but at the same time, mom and dad need to have their opinions and their observations and their intuition recognized and need to be considered all of the time. Mm-hmm. And I think some providers mm-hmm. are better than others with that. And I think that we are, you know, for the most part, 
a lot of times it's time that, you know, I, I that, well, I can, gosh, I can go in a total tangent <laughs> about healthcare issues, but anyway. We, we but still believe relate. like, or agree to pretty much everything about that. Yeah. Um, yes. But I think it's a good, a good takeaway from this is if you have that intuition that like as parents, we, we want to trust the healthcare providers and we want to trust that they're doing everything, but sometimes they're just doing more than they need to, or they're trying to test for more than they need to. And it's, it's hard to figure out what that point is as us. Like we, I have, I have no medical knowledge. I know you, you have no medical knowledge. So like, I just have to go off this professional's opinion on what could be going on. Um, and like, that was a big thing. We were trusting them. And then he, yeah, he just like Jenna said, he like, he was pretty lifeless that day. And then he ended up getting blood transfusions. Yeah. Um, and I remember no like when you came in, I think I had stayed the night with him. Um, but I remember when you came in, in the morning, I think you came pretty early that morning. Um, I, like, I literally looked at you. I was like, is this normal? Like, this yeah. isn't normal. That wasn't normal for him. Yeah. No. And, like, it's still, like, it gets to me. Because I was like, this is, yeah, that's, that's not normal. normal. And that's and when I was like, okay, no, something needs to be done. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, it, mom intuition for a reason. And it's so powerful. It's so powerful. Yeah. So, yes. So, yeah. Always speak up. And, you know, um, you can always ask questions. And, um, and there's and a lot of times there's, I think that, well, I guess, depending on what level NICU there are, there's teams of doctors. And so it's not, you know, yep. like they can consult with other doctors and stuff. Like, it's always okay to ask, um, you know, like, why are you doing this? Like, what is that? Like, and, um, and I think that's great to have those conversations. Um, but yeah, I, uh, gosh. There was, yeah, I, I just remember what the teams, there was, there was one yeah. doctor we really, really was really nice. You remember him? Yeah, he was super nice. I yeah. can't remember his name for those. Names, <laughs> and then there was like another doctor, and he she was the complete opposite, and she wanted to do everything and anything that she could possibly, and she wouldn't listen to us. And it was like, yeah, yeah it, was it was really, really frustrating. frustrating. Like, like I feel like it was like almost like she was uh, kind of like almost entertaining her paycheck at that point. Not her paycheck. Mm-hmm. I would say like more or less her curiosity. Yes. Yeah, and it's like. <laughs> Yeah, like curiosity is not. <laughs> like, she wanted to run every test that she could. And... Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. That was the conversation I had with that doctor too, because it was. I felt like we were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, yes, it was a curiosity thing at that point, and I remember it being the like holiday double and triple checking everything is just not needed. Not needed. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of this. Yeah, yeah, and it was yeah before the holidays, and like all I wanted to do was like. Um, watch Christmas shows with, mm-hmm. with my baby at home. <laughs> I didn't want to be in there. And like, I knew that if she needed to be in there, it was one thing, but if we're in there for, yeah, just for medical textbook reasoning, you know, that's another. So, yeah. um, yeah. And I think that, you know, hospitals, there is talk now more about like grounding rooms and stuff like that, that like, having more teams available, um, which I think we do need to have more conversations about across the board of how do we support the whole family in this journey? Because the family unit is so important in addition to the patient. The patient is absolutely a priority, but the patient, the family is also the patient and we need to take Mm -hmm. care of them as well. And really, I mean, and we're told this in healthcare um, where like, you know, families aren't hearing everything you're saying, but I don't think I really understood that until I was a family or I was a patient. And I literally heard about 5% of what they were saying. (laughs) And it was just like, you're in your head. You aren't, you're in that fight or flight mode. You don't, it's hard to process anything at that point. I remember one doctor was Mm -hmm. just staring at his shoes and looking at his shoes and how he had white shoes and his shoelaces were tied weird. And so I have absolutely no idea what he said because <laughs> he focused on his shoes. So, yeah. You know, but um, so I, I don't know where I'm going at with that, but it's just, um, so that's part of what I'm trying to advocate for as well is that, you know, what services can we do um, for more support with the uh, families in the NICU yeah. as well as 
in the hospital in general. It's the the biggest thing is with kids, like um a kid's voice is only so loud. Um, yeah. Sometimes if they're tiny, tiny right Nick you and they're yeah. not gonna be speaking up, they're not gonna be talking for themselves. And it's your job as a parent, mom or dad or even guardian, whatever it is, um, to speak up for your child. To yeah. know kind of to have an idea as to what his base his or her baseline is yeah. like what's normal what's like a little off or like stuff like that i think that's really important mm-hmm. so important yes and did you find um like when you were in hospital in the NICU being a nurse did you find that other nurses treated you differently because um, they knew you were a nurse i would say it depended, um, not as much the nurses, uh, maybe a little bit, but it was more the providers, I would say. Um, they would, I mean, we were in a unique situation because some of them I had worked with in the past. So, um, you know, they, um, some of them said things that they should not have said, um, but they thought they could because I was, you know, a colleague or whatever. Um, but I, I got to the point though, in general, where I tried to avoid medical talk because I did feel like, um, it was assumed that I knew things, but I didn't know things as a mom. Like there's one thing to know, you know, let's say like, um, you know, what an ear infection looks like. Um, like I know how to assess one in a, in a patient, but I'm not going to go and look in my child's ear and diagnose them Mm -hmm. with an ear infection. I mean, I can, but I, I, my knowledge goes out the window. I don't even know if that, because I do, I mean, I think it just goes, it's in a different direction. You know, like you aren't thinking logically as much then it's like, you're thinking more these, I don't know. It's just, it's not the same. And I think that, and I still do to this day, don't really I try to hide the fact that I'm a healthcare provider. So I I don't, so yes, I do think they talked differently, but I I don't know. um... So I guess like, it would just be like, you want to separate the nurse side of you from the mom side of you. Yes. Because you don't want to, you want to obviously love your child and be the mother for your child. You don't want to be that care provider, like the healthcare provider role for your child, right? Yes, absolutely. Because I mean, that could cloud your judgment depending, right? Like you go into, I don't know, the clinic or something and you're like, he's got an ear infection. I know he's got an ear infection. I checked it out myself. Yes. <laughs> and then you got to get in an argument with them and they're like, no, it's not that. Like he's got sinuses or something. They're <laughs> up. I don't know. Yes. You know what I mean? Like. Oh, yeah. Well, I have a problem. I'm probably a difficult patient because like. I, I, I'll kind of like hide it for a second and be like, oh, you know, what is this? And then like, if they say something that's not accurate, then I get all like, oh, like, I know this and this and this <laughs> and, like, and like, they kind of get, get caught off guard. And so I try to work on that. And that's I, a lot, um, I guess to go on a tangent for a second. I mean, I think that's what I had to work on a lot um, of this space between reaction and response. Um, there was so much of that, so, so much of that in the first year that I was so quick to react. And when we react, I mean, with my, I I love learning about the brain and all, and, um, like we use that fight, fight, or freeze, that amygdala, you know, like that little almond in our brain that's constantly on alert. And in the NICU, it's like just continually alarming and we're reacting all the time to whatever danger that is, um, but when we respond, we use more of the logical part of our brain. And for survival purposes, it's very hard to do that in the moment. Um, but there is a space. And sometimes that space between reaction and response does not seem like there is even a space, especially when we're in these moments. But over time, I had to learn that just because I'm feeling threatened doesn't mean that we're not safe in the moment. And I have to practice how to feel safe and not, you know, sometimes like yell, yelling at a provider because they did it wrong. I mean, not yelling is the right word, but you know, like sometimes I'm like, well, maybe um, I can just lengthen my space here. Or maybe if I'm yelling at, you know, my husband or something, like maybe let me try and lengthen the space between reaction and response, if that makes sense. <clears throat> so I've been just yeah, trying to work. Yes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Taking that extra but, pause to maybe think yeah. about <laughs> before you decide to before you say it. something. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, that's definitely a, a great thing, especially when you are um, like it's totally relatable with the anything with hospital related right now. Still with us is kind of like that. Yes. Um, where yes. it's just like gotta try not to like let your first reaction happen essentially just like take a second i find it and it's funny because i find it like a lot harder with our first one not to react when we're like at a doctor's office or at a yes. hospital or anything like that but like with our second because we were completely on the other side of the fence where i had a perfect pregnancy not like a perfect pregnancy but like pretty much everything was pretty much everything was fine yeah <laughs> um i not i had no complications but it's like with her, I'm like, oh, I can take her to the doctors and like not react. Okay, she has this, she has that, like whatever. But it's like with Liam, it's like, oh my god, like is he like does he have this? Is that because of this? Is it because of this? Like I'm just like, yes, constantly in her like in their ears with Liam yeah. or with our little one. Yeah, there. It's like the rabbit holes you can go down. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, go to Doctor Google. Google and find out your child's oh done because you you Googled he has a cough and you're like, oh, oh no. <laughs> yeah. I know if I look like I'm sure there is somewhere like the history of my Google searches during that first year and a uh, gosh, I can't even. <laughs> I'm sure there's all sorts yeah. of like rabbit holes that because it, it. I mean, I totally get that too. Where it is like with um the NICU, like you do have this um this PTSD a little bit where it's hard to like, I'm, I'm reminded of it so many times when we go to the doctor's offices and I am mm -hmm. expecting to hear something that I don't want to hear. Like I'm on guard for the, you know, like for some, some news to be told to me um, constantly. And so, I mean, like, I recognize that now. And, you know, my daughter's old enough that like, I feel like, um, she picks up on those things. So we talk about it a little bit and I say, you know, like, you know, when you were in the NICU, um, this was hard. And like, she asked questions and, um, you know, she obviously doesn't remember. And she was like, cause I was saying something like you were crying and I wasn't there and it made me sad. I remember that was one time I took a, um, I rested in a hotel room for a night, um, and the nurses took care of her. And I remember coming back in the next day and she was crying and all alone. It was just heart wrench, like gut wrenching to see. And, oh, yeah. um, I told her that she was like, mom, I was fine. And I was like, <laughs> I guess I needed to hear that because, uh, I wasn't fine, but I guess you were fine. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, but... yeah, I actually remember like, it feels like it was like yesterday, even though it's almost like three years now that we've had our little Close guy, uh -huh. but it's like so fresh in your mind still. But like, I remember yes. him getting transferred from his, from Montfort, um, to Chio. And, and like, like the, the first, first night, night we weren't expecting, expecting to stay with him, him at the hospital because like, like at the other, the other hospitals, hospitals, they would just take care of him overnight. Night. I would call in the morning, see how he, like, like how his night went. Mm -hmm. Um, and then and we then would come visit him in the morning. morning. Yeah, because they didn't have the space for us. Yeah, because yeah, they, they didn't have, have yeah, yeah, they, they didn't have, have accommodations for us. us. And then, like, like at Chio, they're like, um, I remember them saying, saying something along the lines of, oh, like, like who's, who's staying, staying tonight? tonight? And, like, like both, both of us were like, like um, yeah. what do you mean, yeah. who's staying? Like, we weren't prepared to stay with him. And, mm -hmm. like, we, we both, both, like, I think <laughs> on the way home, we're like, oh, my God, I feel so terrible. Like, I feel awful that I'm leaving my what like two month old one and a half two yeah, so two good. months maybe at a hospital by himself that they told us that like they only have so many nurses to like the patients and like that if he's you know having a hard time like they may not be able to attend to him right away and i'm thinking like oh my god like i felt terrible <laughs> Thankfully, I, he was pretty good at night. Like he sleep, yeah. like he's always been good at night, and like doesn't put up too much yeah. of a fuss. But I just felt terrible, like thinking that like maybe he's gonna be crying or upset or whatever, and they can't attend to him right away. Yes, I totally relate to that. Yeah, because it is. It's a terrible feeling, mm -hmm. and oh, I remember like those pumps. Like the, um, cause we had to do the pump cause she was in the NICU, like the sound of that machine. I remember pumping yeah. in the hotel room yeah. and just, yes, I think that, that memory of like just feeling awful and that sound <laughs> and, um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it is wild that, you know, we're, I think 
I mean, as, as moms and dads, like it's so much harder so many times on the parents than the kids. Like, I mean, uh, I, I mean, not that it's, I mean, it's obviously hard on these babies and all, but I think I, I'm, I'm almost like glad we had that conversation, my daughter and I, because not that I want her to be like, oh, it's okay, mom, because that's not her job. But at the same time, it, it's a good reminder of like putting into perspective of like, okay, it, it was okay. I needed that. I needed rest. And that is okay. Like we need to fill our cups up in order to mm-hmm. fill other people up, including our baby. Like we, that's what we need. And I think that that goes back to the society and the self of like, this is what I should do as a mom and I should be here and I should do this. but. No, I mean, that's not, that's not the case, you know, like you, the the hard part is like, we've touched on this before a couple of times now, and it's, you you can't really take care of your child until you take care of yourself. Yes. That's such a big thing, especially with new parents or when you have such extenuating circumstances where you just, you just don't take care of yourself, right? Like if you stop sleeping, you stop eating, or maybe stop just doing anything really that is productive for yourself and all you're doing is trying to take care of your kid you're really not going to end up taking care of them the best to your ability yes absolutely or to be aware of your emotions yeah and i also remember um from like the hospital and stuff like that the nurses <laughs> the nurses are so great because i mean yes they know their patients but they some, some of them knew us because we were in there every day i mean we were yeah we would see the same ones every time whatever they would know like when you are burnt out and we did have a few nurses that were super super nice i mean our little guy was pretty straightforward for the night usually no big hiccups but like they would i had a couple times where they were like do you just want to go home (laughs) <laughs> and we'll watch him for the night and like i felt like the one night yeah because we were in like the more like what you call it room the the NICU kind yeah, of we were like a more like intensive room so there's one nurse for three beds yeah and parents were staying there anyways but the i remember i can't remember what his name is but he, he was really nice to you and he's like do you want to just go home like he's like i don't mind sitting and watching him he's usually really good he's usually fine like oh. I, you're good to go like, if you, you wanted to you came home and did sleep in the bed at least and yeah <laughs> rest outside the hospital not hearing the alarm go off every time his oxygen dipped a little bit oh my yeah. gosh beep, 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 beep. <laughs> yeah. yes it was just yeah the hospital is just um, it's so hard to get over the the beeping of the monitors and stuff like that like mm-hmm. even though i i every other night I would come home, I would, I would still hear the beeping Mm -hmm. of the monitors, like in my sleep. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Which I think touches back with like the PTSD. Um, I mean, every once in a while, like I have like these weird vivid dreams about it, even still, like it just comes back to haunt me every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah. I think my biggest thing where I get flashbacks, I mean, those, the doctor's offices, but in particular, um, there's an IV involved, like, um, or like a, sh- a shot, but like the, it's that like drawing blood, like it really, um, that's hard. And I, I yeah. remember the last time it happened, um, I traveled back in time in my head and I, I literally wanted to, I wanted to do the fight or flight at that point. I wanted to run away, which I wasn't going to, cause my daughter needed me. Um, but, or I also wanted to like argue or fight with like whoever wanted to challenge me, you know? And it was just, it was like embodying that. And I remember the nurse hugged me. Um, and that was so so um profound to have that kind of response from someone because I wasn't expecting to be hugged in that moment you know and like she was like I think you need a hug and it brought me back to the present moment um and that truly I think that that time was when I was like I I need to I need to write about this and do like podcast I need to help mm-hmm. moms because I, you know, like we need to support each other. Like that nurse supported me that day and hugged me like that. Um, so it's still hard. I still have my, my husband go into, um, doctor's office appointments sometimes. Um, but I give myself grace about that. I mean, like, you know what, like 
it's okay. Like if I, I will be there if I need to, but it's okay if he goes and, you know, like, um, like we're all working on things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I was very much like that with you. Um, yeah. Whenever our little guy had to have um, the sleep studies and stuff like that, I just mm -hmm. couldn't. I couldn't do it. That was hard. He, yeah, he, because you know the sleep studies, how they go with they got everything on their heads, everything's yes. attached to them, and then you'd have to put them in like their kind of crib thing. Mm -hmm. And he's you know old enough to crawl around and do whatever. But oh yeah, and get angry because well yeah old and, and old enough that he knows that this is not home couldn't really pick him up because he can only go like <laughs> half a foot from the bed yes yeah and then try and settle I him got some PTSD from that. yeah i can't stand going into the sleep study no yeah no i can imagine that's so hard it's so hard yeah it's hard because they start to really know their surroundings and then they're upset because they're not at home and they're upset because they can't move because you're sure. like you're on a restraint like, like with all the cords you can sit on your bed buddy and we can play some toys hopefully yeah <laughs> i know you just had a 40 minute nap on the way here but let's uh yeah let's go to bed now and yeah, that was the other yeah. thing too like with the traveling and stuff like that like we we live 40 45 minutes away from the hospital so it was always a commute mm. um when he was in the NICU yeah um back and forth every day <laughs> yeah it's well living in two places for us like we were um in um you know some hospitals in, um in Texas and then in Chicago and um i i think cause in Chicago like it like i've already have been through a couple of these things before so i knew more what to expect so i think i tried to be I don't know if mindful is the right word. I was trying to work on mindfulness. I don't know if I was actually mindful, but I do remember um, trying to plan so much to go back to the hospital mentally. Um, and I guess two things with this was on our drive there, um, like I was mentally preparing so hard um, and a car swerved into our lane and we almost like got into a really bad accident where I don't know if any of us would have made it if my husband didn't like slam on the brakes right away and just goes to show how much I was ruminating about some danger that ended up being fine. But this car thing, I had absolutely no idea, you know, like it was just wild life where it's just like, I wasn't, you know, like try preparing myself for this. Thing. So it just it goes to show kind of like, I don't know, this control, this lack of control I have, but I'm trying to control things all the time. But then, um, I do remember, and this was during the pandemic. Um, so I, I, we could only have one parent in the room. And, um, so it was me. And I just remember looking at the skyline, um, with her and, um, just having a really beautiful moment with her that like, I think I'll always remember cause we were looking at the stars and my grandpa passed away um, right before that, like, and he was sick and all, but I just felt his presence there. And like, we were talking about great grandpa and, um, I felt like he was there with us. Um, and, um, so I don't know, I try to find these silver linings and these experiences that I wish we never had. I wish we, like she never had to endure any of the, these things, but at the same time, um, what can we learn? What can we do about this? And how can I, um help others with this um i think is what i've tried to mm -hmm. um anyway sorry that was like a tangent <laughs> no, that's <okay. laughs> um that's a that's an excellent point just helping others i think is super yeah. important just having a voice for maybe someone to resonate with or to yes feel attached to or maybe just to understand that what's inside their head is okay and maybe, you know, it's, it's, it'll be okay. Like, it's just, it's a lot maybe in the moment, but it'll, it'll get better. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I think yeah. that, um, I mean, I don't know about for everyone out, or like every condition out there and all these things, um, just with like my pediatric stuff back in the day, like, I know that there's a lot of, um, support groups, um, Facebook in mm -hmm. particular has a lot of support groups that, I encourage people to find if they um, are struggling with something in particular that they don't feel like 
you know, maybe friends or family are familiar with. I, I think that those can be so helpful um, to know that you're not alone. Um, and, and yeah, trying, um, yeah, that's what I, I just try to do now is to help people find these resources because um, they're, they are out there. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. I, I wish we would be taught more about it, like in our pregnancy journey. And I think that, that it's changing a bit. Um, the dialogue of like, there's this new term called matrescence that I've been hearing a lot recently. I, are you all familiar with that term at all? No. <laughs> so I literally just heard about it. Like ever since I started the podcast, never heard of it before, but it's this thing that it, and it makes sense. It's um, this um, term that's kind of gaining traction of there's adolescence, but there's matrescence. And so it's essentially growing as a mother. Um, like you grow as a t teenager, like it's the same thing. Um, and there is um, matrescence. You're always learning and every child's kind of different. Like matrescence is different with every child and all of that too. Um, I don't know where I was going at with that, but <laughs> it, it's just, um, I thought that that was an interesting term and sorry. I. It had a point with that, but <laughs> That's, yeah. that. just for the different groups there for people that they yes. can reach out kind of thing. And yes. Uh huh. That, that sort of dialogue, right? So yeah. Understanding that it's just changing and reach out if you need to kind of thing. I don't think we reached out at all. We didn't look at anything. No. Cause I, I think, think we were just too, <sighs> just, I don't know. We were just too in the moment, like too invested in like what was going on and uh, yeah, similar to you where you're like, I was staring at the doctor's shoes. That's yeah. what kind of like every day felt, right? Where you're yes, you're just kind of on autopilot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think is the best way to put that, right? And you don't I think so. think about anything outside of that hospital room. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, I agree. It's <laughs> definitely, definitely hard. So That like shapes that was, you. It gets... Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's definitely quite the... Uh, quite the journey that you had yeah oh yeah, you, absolutely. we definitely relate to a lot of what you're talking about a lot of it yeah yeah well i appreciate <laughs> you letting me share the journey because I, I i love hearing other people in their journeys and being in you know community together with um, people who kind of understand um so again thank you for what you're doing and helping people know that they're not alone we really appreciate the kind words valerie um yeah that's definitely definitely our goal of our podcast is again yeah. just to build that community of trust and um and relatability as well yeah and thanks for like sharing your story with everyone uh, mm -hmm. i know it's not easy so absolutely takes a lot of courage thank you yeah. so much we got a got a couple quick questions for you though we got to lighten yeah. the mood a little bit <laughs> oh, all right um, so we, we like to ask a couple questions to everyone at least. Um, so if you were tomorrow, if you were to win like the lottery, what would be the first thing that you would do? Oh, uh, I'd travel somewhere, uh, Australia probably, or Japan. I've been wanting to go to Japan recently. Maybe I'd do all of it. That whole area. <laughs> do the I whole love thing. traveling. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. You want to ask the other one? Yeah, sure. Um, what would you do? Or sorry, sorry. no. Um, where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, so I'll be 45. I don't know. I guess probably doing the same thing, like probably driving more kids to sports and being an Uber driver more, like, but of my kids, not an actual Uber. <laughs> <laughs> continuing that whole thing so <laughs> um but I do try to um yeah I like to travel so maybe a couple other places travel that I've been traveling to um the next five years as well yeah cool how about you guys and then one last oh, it would... oh. Five years from now? <laughs> oh gosh we ask people the questions we didn't <laughs> <laughs> what do we be doing um it's hard to say because Five years could change a lot for us. Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Depends on our circumstances. But I would see more or less of maybe us. Uh, we'd probably still obviously be doing the podcast and talking. And <laughs> I thought you were going to say we would still be together. I was going to say, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, too. Like, I don't know. 
probably uh the kids will be a little bit older then yeah so they'll both be in school yeah, yeah like, like grade one i don't know grade two three maybe yeah <laughs> i can't math right now together. but they uh it'd be different they'd probably be into lots of sports and stuff mm -hmm. hopefully so be probably traveling a lot like doing different yeah. stuff like that Our like evenings will go from them sleeping at seven o'clock to us be maybe grabbing dinner at seven so. or eight <laughs> yeah. oh yeah oh yeah the late bedtimes is something else i have to get up really early now because i don't get Oof. time at nighttime because they always want to stay up later especially in the summer it's like oh my yes gosh, you guys because they're like it's light out it's not dark or it's not late it's yeah light it doesn't out. get dark till like 10 yes <laughs> I know. it's like it's, it's late busy. damn it <laughs> <laughs> now it's getting dark at like five it's to like four o'clock yeah yes yeah. same here it's exciting so uh for everyone at home where can everyone find out more about you yeah thank you um so you can check out everything that i have uh, on my website uh which is two mom is two love.com and that has access to my podcast which is called two mom is to love with valerie propsfeld np you can click on it through my website, or it's also available on Spotify, Apple, and Google. Um, I'm on Instagram, Valerie underscore Propsfeld, as well as um, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and um, Propsfeld's quite a, a German name, but you know <laughs> that's what it is right <laughs> now. But uh, it's uh, if you need the spelling, it's P R O B S T F E L D. And I would love it if you come join us groups of moms and we just embrace imperfection together and love as a community. Perfect. All right. And we'll have everything linked and good to go. So I think that's it for us today. Um, so this is the Real Life Parenting with our guest, Valerie Propsfield. And as always, I'm Jeff. And I'm Jenna. And thank you for listening.